Township. I'm going to hand off to Skip Shooter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks everyone for coming out this evening. I'm Skip Shooter. I'm the uh, Chief Operating Officer for Keystone Shops. Uh, we will be having a uh, dispensary here on at 420 West Lancaster Avenue in Devon. Uh, so part of our mission is to actually connect with the community and uh, start to have a dialogue, an open dialogue about what this means. It's a big change for Pennsylvania, um, and a lot of people have questions. So we wanted to start with this sort of an educational session, and we're gonna open it up um, to questions at the end. But we do have a few things that we wanna take you through, and you'll get to meet some of the members of our team. Uh, so we'll start off with some introductions and take you through uh, what is the medical marijuana program, as Pennsylvania has defined it, uh, why was it approved in Pennsylvania? A little bit about the history and background. We'll talk about who qualifies for certified medical use and what's going to happen at the dispensary. And then we're going to open it up for a question and an answer. So um, these are the bios of the three people that will be speaking tonight. We actually have a number of representatives for our organization. Um, so uh, certainly uh, as you talk to people and network, uh, you may be running into people from Keystone Shops, but Jason Mitchell over here is uh, our, uh, our deep dive domain expert, has a lot of experience in running uh, dispensaries. He's actually from the Lehigh Valley originally. Most of, actually our, our whole team are sort of native Pennsylvanians or longtime Pennsylvanians as opposed to uh, some groups. But uh, Jason has spent the last seven years working in Colorado uh, running dispensaries, uh, so he has a lot of great experience uh, that he's bringing to the table and uh, has been leading us um, in terms of particularly relationships with grower processors and uh, understanding the, the operating procedures and that kind of thing. So we realize that we're happy to have him. Uh, we also have Dr. Louis Vanderbeek, who's going to be speaking as well. Uh, Louis is a, a long-term uh, physician. He's uh, work, he, he has a practice in the Fort Richmond section, and as you can see, quite a, an extensive list of credentials within the city of Philadelphia. Uh, Louis actually has been studying this uh, all the way back to when he was a resident physician, uh, where he actually studied the use of cannabis on um, oncology patients and cancer patients. Uh, so he has a deep and long background with that as well. Uh, I'm Skip Shuda. Uh, my background is mostly in starting businesses. Uh, for two and a half years, I've been running education and advocacy uh, programs uh, through, uh, through a site that I had. And uh, it's actually how some of our team came together through some of these courses that I was putting on over the last two and a half years. I teach entrepreneurship down at the Wharton Small Business Development Center, and, um, and I'm just doing whatever it takes to try to pull the pieces together and get things up and running. So that's a little bit about who will be speaking this evening. Um, I'm going to start by turning it over to Dr. Vanderbeek to talk about what is medical marijuana in PA. Thank you very much for hosting us tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. I have to say, um, although developing this structure and getting involved in this activity has been one of the most exciting and unique things of my life, I do really come at it from a medical perspective. I don't so much understand the business aspects. I don't so much understand the aspects that, that um, are involved on the legal side. Clearly, there's been an awful lot of that. But I'm really coming from the medical perspective, so I wanted to share some of that today. And I wanted to give you a little bit of insight into why I, as a, as a physician who's been in practice now for 27 years, sees this stuff as really being helpful in a way that's extraordinarily consistent with the homeostasis of the human body. In other words, the way we live is how we stay in balance, and the balance within the human body relies on various systems, some of which upregulate and produce things which work within the body, some of which down-regulate and inhibit the production of certain substances in the body, and some of which do both. I have to tell you, um, cannabis is a fairly remarkable plant in that there are ingredients within cannabis that can do all of these things. 
The other thing to keep in mind is anything that we can upregulate in the body, a substance that we can use as a key to produce a given neurohumor, a given a neurotransmitter, a given anti-inflammatory, can also be used to inhibit that through downregulation. So some of that is ironic as you hear that, for instance, marijuana can be used to increase appetite, something we know very, very well. But at the same time, marijuana has been tremendously explored, in some cases unsuccessfully, as a diet drug. Very well. Um, first of all, in terms of the forms available. The forms that are going to be available in Pennsylvania include the oils, liquids, pills, creams, and tinctures. There will be no flour. There will be no flour in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have been led to believe that that will change fairly soon, but at the current time, all marijuana that's produced in Pennsylvania, and for this program, it must be produced in Pennsylvania, will be uh, processed by the growers into these forms. Um, there are some advantages to this, clearly. It makes dosing more precise. It makes it easier to make recommendations. We can't actually call it prescribing because, as you know, it's a federally illegal substance designated as class one by the DEA. But in making our recommendations for the various formulations, <clears throat> it's much easier for us to know exactly what the ratios are of the critical substances, primarily what we call cannabidiol and, and THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. It's much easier to know exactly what those ratios are because of the way this is being produced. And I think it's entirely consistent with the medical model that, in fact, the state has decided not to have flour available initially. Although, again, we've been told there is a mechanism in place to allow that to occur, and it's our sense that it will occur fairly soon. Um, I wanted to take a moment just to talk about the cannabinoids. All right, There are basically three types of cannabinoids. Um, there's synthetic cannabinoids, which have been produced over time, and some of them are prescribed readily now. Uh, marinol or dronabinol is very well known. It's typically used in patients to increase their appetite, the same way we would use megase or, or certain um, other hormonal preparations. It's fairly successful. It can produce a little bit of euphoria, but it doesn't get people really high. But it does help some of our patients um, have a better appetite to be able to resist. <clears throat> For those patients who are having trouble eating, secondary to the use of um, chemotherapy, chemotherapeutic agents or whatever, um, there's also been failure on the synthetic side. Ramonaban was a drug which was developed very specifically, very specifically as a dietary supplement. It was actually approved in the European Union and was on the market for some years and produced very interesting psychiatric side effects, including severe depression. It was never licensed in the United States of America. As you know, the FDA uh, procedure is a little bit more elaborate than what exists in the European Union, and that product, in fact, never came to market. It, it was a Sanofi product. Uh, there were other similar products, Me Too products, if you will, very close to market, being developed by Pfizer and by Merck. Those never came into being for the simple reason that the psychiatric side effects, because of the what was considered to be irreversible binding, they would bind to the sites in the hypothalamus which produce appetite, but they wouldn't let go. And apparently the side effect of that was, in fact, depression. Those people who think that food, in fact, makes us happy, and I'd be a prime example of that, are probably right. <laughs> um, plant cannabinoids. Um, clearly, that's what we're talking about, and that's what we're talking about in the medical marijuana program. Uh, THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, and CBD. And there are various CBDs. There are numerous CBDs. And these are the primary, um, the primary reagents that we'll be measuring and looking at as we develop our program. It's very interesting. THC and CBD work together, and THC and CBD work against each other. THC is the substance which produces the euphoria which we associate with, mar with marijuana. CBD, interestingly enough, tends to inhibit that somewhat, but not in all cases. The issue really is, where are the receptors? Where are the receptors for these substances so that they exert their impact? One of the reasons why we feel, for instance, that marijuana can be extraordinarily helpful in the management of pain is because CBD receptors do exist in high density in the pain centers in the brain. At the same time, 
In the brain stem, there are no CBD receptors. Why is that important? When we talk about pain relief, what have we classically done in medicine? We've provided opioids. We were told at one point they were safe. We know that they do help with pain, and unfortunately, they become extraordinarily popular. They're also extraordinarily abused. Unfortunately, a great number of the opioid receptors are located in the brain stem. The brain stem is responsible for the brain communicating with the body. Those who experience overdoses of the adverse effects of, opioid, of the opioid epidemic typically die from stopping breathing. What happens is their breathing is suppressed because of the binding with the receptors in the brain stem. This is, a, this is the primary problem with opioids because as you develop that addiction, you take higher and higher doses to fulfill those receptors. It takes more and more and more, and ultimately breathing is suppressed, and the next thing are, that we see as a statistic. That is absolutely not possible with cannabis. Those receptors do not exist in the brain stem, and whereas we can get the same benefit of pain relief, you in fact, you in fact cannot overdose to the point of respiratory suppression with cannabis. This is why we think cannabis is a huge hope for those individuals who are going to um, need the pain relief. And as we take a quick look at the, uh, at the conditions which are covered, the 17 conditions which are covered under the Pennsylvania law, we're going to see that pain enters into the um, picture very frequently. So what do we see happening? We see people being given an alternative to addictive opioids, to the danger of opioids, to use a substance which can in fact produce the analgesic effect without producing the uh, suppression of the breathing. What, how do I even answer? It's a, the mouse, actually. Uh, so, <coughs> sorry. Had, did you want to go to the, talk about the conditions right away, Lou? Or, well, so the next thing we had was sort of an overview I of the program. Right, I want to have that on. <coughs> That's a good one. I think it's important. Okay, no, this That's what's next. Gotcha. All right. All right, well, we're in phase one of the program. Uh, Keystone Dispensary, or Keystone Shops as we're known now, was successful in obtaining one of the permits locally. Each permit allows us to have three locations. Our three locations will be located in Delaware County, Montgomery County, and then our principal location, which will be in Chester County in Devon, at the old Dairy Queen up on Lancaster Avenue near the Bowling Alley. You've probably come by and see that we've made a great deal of progress there, thanks to my colleagues, and we're right on schedule, right on schedule for opening. I'm happy to say. The grower processors, there will be a total of 25 statewide. So far, 12 of those licenses have been granted. We believe there'll probably be about 10 grower processors who will be up and running uh, by the beginning of next year. We are not sure exactly when product will be available, but we're currently in discussions with the Jason of this will speak up, uh, relative to the, actual, the procurement of the product and the details surrounding that procurement. That is an extraordinarily regulated process, I'm sure you understand. Um, and we are not sure when product will actually be available. All that we can do is forge ahead and have our sites ready as soon as product is available. And we commit to you that when product is available, we will be there to provide it and bring it, in fact, to the therapeutic landscape on the first day that is possible. <laughs> Currently, as Skip has often said, Ironically, the only people who can legally possess marijuana in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania are children under the age of 18. That's because of a safe harbor uh, provision in the Act, which says that a family which has a child who has um, used medical marijuana, usually for seizures, also for autism, uh, may in fact bring that marijuana from out of state. That safe harbor, so to speak, expires the day that product becomes available here. So thank goodness children in Pennsylvania, and there are a fair number, I believe it's about 160 safe harbor letters have been issued, um, and there are 160 kids now, the majority with irretractable seizures, who are getting huge benefit, huge benefit from the product. Ironically, they're the only legal users of cannabis right now in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. That's sure to change soon. Uh, it's believed in the Philadelphia region there's going to be approximately, at the time we did this slide, it was uh, 20 sites that will be opening. There have been some issues. Um, some of the sites, two in Philadelphia, have been knocked out because even though they had zoning and one city council person acted up to 
became enraged, and they, they have uh, lost their zoning apparently. Another site was being purchased, and those who were selling it, by the way, Simon, uh, who owns King of Prussia Mall and owns Franklin Mills, they are apparently on a national war path against these things. And uh, a, an organization which actually bought a pad, it was an old Chi Chi restaurant in the parking lot of Franklin Mills, I know this well. That was to have been a site, but it's now they've managed, or, or they're fighting, Simon, which has unlimited money and unlimited lawyers, is fighting to move it to federal court. If in fact they end up in federal court, because this is still a federally illegal substance, I would think that dispensary is unlikely to win. The good news is that Keystone Shops did its homework. We obtained zoning, we've obtained, uh, we've had great success in obtaining permits. There have been some small obstacles, there always will be. Uh, but we, number one, we're the local guys, we're the folks from around here. Our entire group is basically Pennsylvania born and bred, and myself being the exception, I moved here at 18 to go to school, I grew up in New York. But we're the local group, we're the locally funded group, and we believe we're the ones who can make it happen in this area for this area. Just so you're aware, we are very likely to be the only dispensary in all of Delaware County. There will be two in uh, Chester County that, we, that we're aware of, uh, the one that we speak of here in Devon, and then there will be another organization which will have a site in Phoenixville. Um, and in Montgomery County, apparently there will be five or six. We, at last count, there were going to be five, and we will be one of those. Our site in Montgomery County is on Henderson Road, leading up towards King of Russia. So very accessible to this area as well. All right, should we go over the diseases a little bit? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, we had, and with the order, we had Jason go and talk about okay. conditions, but uh, if you'd like to- I think we should go over a few of the conditions. I think we should the conditions as Let's well. go right to the conditions. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of the folks here were asking some of the questions. I think it's not just important to talk about the conditions, I think it's important to talk about the mechanisms. Because there's a great deal of duplication in the mechanism. And what I'd like to do is basically give a 10 minute primer on how it's believed, how it's believed the cannabis affects the human body. First of all, there is something called the endocannabinoid system. You have cannabinoids in your body. Just like you can upregulate your thyroid, you can downregulate your thyroid, you can upregulate your adrenal gland, you can downregulate your adrenal gland. There are endocannabinoids which up, up regulate certain systems in the human body, including inflammation and others, and which down regulate. So what we basically see is that there's a large group of receptors in the brain itself. Those are mostly what we call the CB1 receptors, all right, which tend to affect mental health, which tend to affect those things which are based in the brain. Those receptors would have a tremendous effect, for instance, on pain those receptors would have a tremendous effect on spasticity. Um, then there are peripheral receptors, mostly what's known as CB2 receptors, a different form of receptor, and the vast majority of those deal much more with the immune system and deal with the issue of inflammation. Remember, inflammation is the devil. It's why you take all these antioxidants. Inflammation is responsible for a tremendous number of the diseases we suffer, some of them very obvious, such as arthritis, which is inflammation in the joint, and some of them a little bit less obvious, such as, for instance, multiple sclerosis, which may very well be due to inflammation destroying the lining, the insulation of the nerves. So as we go down some of these, we can see that ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, 30, 000, uh, an incidence of 30,000 with a life expectancy of two to five years. It's believed that a AML, or Lou Gehrig's disease, may in fact be mediated by inflammation at the nerve roots, and we believe that CBD, and there is some anecdotal evidence as well as experiential evidence, that life expectancy is extended by the use of um, cannabis in AML. Again, because of two effects, the anti-inflammatory effect and the anti-spasticity effect. It seems to have some muscle relaxant effect for those individuals who have spasticity in their muscles, and we're talking about the people who claw, and the people who are unable to freely move, that there is a relaxing effect based on central nervous system receptors, which the CB1 would seem to approach, would seem to uh, link to. Autism, there's a tremendous amount of work being done now in Israel, as we were discussing before, on autism. That, it's very interesting. What seems to occur there is that 
The behaviors seem to be more manageable. Individuals seem to experience less of the anxiety, which is generally associated with autism. And there seems to be more of a re re relaxing effect, relaxing effect on the nerves. One of the interesting things that I found about autism is that whereas many of the effects which occur in the central nervous system seem to be mediated by this CB1, this cannabidiol, in the case of autism, the most effective um, combinations that we seem to see seem to be higher in THC. All right, so unfortunately there is some, if you will, uh, euphoria associated with that. And that's probably not unfortunate, I shouldn't have said it that way. But the simple fact of the matter is, it's the balance between these two things, the CBD and the THC, which seem to determine the effect. And in the case of autism, where you would think it would be one, in fact it's the other. All of this is basically symbolic of the tremendous amount of information which we don't have relative to the cannabinoids. Cancer, well, the major effect in cancer, and this is something I did work on about 30 years ago, um, the major effect in cancer seems to be the restoration of appetite for those individuals who don't feel like eating while they're undergoing treatment or if they're not undergoing treatment. And um, clearly, you know, the, um, the ability to control nausea. In other words, there's a tremendous enhancement of uh, quality of life in individuals who are experiencing cancer treatment. There are some theories relative to the ability of uh, cannabinoids to affect apoptosis, to actually kill cells. And apparently this is an effect which some believe is limited to rapidly dividing cells such as cancer cells and does not affect normal cells. If so, that would be wonderful. Truly, it's one of those areas in which the research has not been done because it's really hard to do research when the government tells you they're going to arrest you. So that hasn't happened, but there is there is some there are theories relative to that. But that's presented to you as a possible theory. Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is one of the inflammatory diseases of the bowel. It's a horrible disease for those who experience it. It's extraordinarily common. The anti-inflammatory effects. The anti-inflammatory effects, specifically of CBT2 receptors through the colon seem to very much calm Crohn's disease and can restore the quality of life for those individuals. Damage to the, uh, to the spinal cord. Well, it's very clear that um, amongst those individuals who have experienced actual damage to their spinal cord, the part of the mechanism by which they lose function is the loss of the protective layer around the nerve uh, which is the myelin sheet, the insulation of the wire, so to speak. While the mechanism is not entirely understood, it's believed to be inflammatory in nature. In other words, the body responds by releasing something known as cytokines, which will promote inflammation and damage that nerve long term. Having said that, the quicker, in this case, the quicker something is administered, which inhibits the inflammation, the inflammatory response, the more likely the individual is to have diminished amount of damage. So the actual use in spinal cord injury would seem to be something that we would want to do as soon as you possibly could. Again, it's the decrease of inflammation which the body develops as a response to the insult, as a response to the injury. The ability to inhibit that inflammation probably will decrease the damage that is sustained long term. Epilepsy, again, one in 26 Americans with epilepsy. Um, very clearly, um, <coughs> this seems to work better in children than in, than in adults, though I think it's been used more in children because there's been more compassionate use there. Uh, amongst families with autism, one third of those kids tend to experience, um, they have uh, seizures. There was recently a publication out of Langone Medical Center at NYU in New York about um, the use of cannabinoids. Specifically though, again, um, enhanced with high levels of THC to help children with irretractable seizures. I have a patient in my practice, in fact, who is doing this. There is a site you may have heard of, Charlotte's Web, which is producing a high CBD oil. Most people seem to have better experience when the CBD is mixed with the THC, but all these are details. The fact of the matter is, Kids with intractable seizures who are not doing well with their current medication seem to respond extraordinarily well. Not in every case. It, it certainly doesn't constitute a cure, but, but somehow by having this relaxing effect on the nerves, the number of seizures is hugely decreased. 
glaucoma. I have a patient, he's a, he was, uh, he's a Jamaican gentleman. He's been using uh, marijuana for 53 years. He, he got um, pediatric glaucoma, very unusual situation, and actually used marijuana at the age of 12 to decrease intraocular pressure. I actually invited him to come here tonight, but he was uncomfortable because, guess what, it's illegal. <laughs> and he, um, he continues to use it, and of course, in the, in the, um, in the interim, excellent medications have been developed for the treatment of glaucoma. We have great drugs, and I said, why not just use the drugs? It's been easier, it's legal, the insurance covers it. He said it doesn't work as well. So he prefers to use the, uh, the marijuana. But that's something that's been very, very well established, and in fact, was very well known in Jamaica early on, before they really defined what glaucoma was, but they had the experience of the pressure in the eye. Somebody in Jamaica had the idea that this, these two would be linked. It was then academically studied, and in fact, the use of um, cannabinoids in glaucoma is, is extraordinarily well established. Uh, positive status for HIV. This is very interesting. Very clearly, the anti-emetic effects of um, cannabis are very helpful to, H to symptomatic HIV patients. To in individuals who are on many of the antivirals which we currently use, uh, these folks can once again eat, enjoy a meal with the use of cannabinoids. There's no surprise there. However, there's also a theory that says that because of its effect directly on the T cells, the, the immune system, the cellular-based immunity of the human body, that in fact, you may enhance immune function you may enhance immune function through the use of cannabis. Now that's not intuitive, because so much of what we're talking about is inhibiting immune function, decreasing inflammation. Inflammation is, is actually the response of the human body to insult. So how can we decrease inflammation on the one hand, which is diminishing a natural response to insult, and on the other hand, enhance the immune system? That's where this issue of upregulation and downregulation comes in, and it's something that clearly needs to be studied. For now, I will tell you, I think the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has gone very, very far in making HIV status, not AIDS per se, but HIV status, one of the conditions which is covered under the Act. If we were to go through the rest, which I, I think I've taken probably more than my share of time, we basically see there's a theme here. Anti-inflammatory effect, anti-spasmodic effect in terms of uh, those who experience spasticity in a variety of conditions, uh, including Huntington's chorea, Parkinsonism. I actually have a um, patient with pseudobulbar Parkinsonism. That's the Parkinsonism where they cough a lot, have difficulty breathing, and this gentleman is truly an end stage. He is an old timer who says, I, to be blunt, I ain't taking that shit. <laughs> and I'm praying that this fellow makes it until the time when it's legitimized, when it's legal, this is a, an absolute instance of somebody who, once it was legal, he's going to be willing to try it. But the failure, the failure of our society to respond to that sooner may very well cost this person his life. And this is somebody who could truly, truly benefit because he also has the anorexia, which is associated with the inability to chew, which occurs in, um, later on in Parkinsonism. He's having difficulty breathing because the muscles of respiration are affected. His tremors are very significant and he has failed the retinue of standard medications which we use. Um, the other effect, obviously, that we want to talk about in general is just the anti-neuropathy. So much of pain is neuropathic. I met yesterday with a group of physical therapists who are so frustrated because they say, once we've treated an injury, okay, what we call nociceptive pain, pain caused by injury, actual injury to tissue, once we've treated nociceptive pain, and the pain continues, what are we to do? The tissue is healed, there's not an obvious source for the pain, and yet we know the individual is still in pain. The answer there is obviously that this is a pain which is occurring through the irritation of the nerves, through the healing process which has occurred in the nerve tissue, either through the myelin sheath or the nerve itself. That's where we believe that cannabis can probably exert its greatest effect. And as those of us in the room get a little bit older, experience a little bit more pain, perhaps the neuropathy of diabetes, perhaps the neuropathy that comes from a, a, a life of low back pain, perhaps the neuropathy that would occur from any compression of any nerve in the human body. I think we all know that pain. 
It's our hope, our, our, our greatest hope, that this may be a way to treat that, primarily through the use of CBD, perhaps also using THC, so that individuals, and I must add, I just turned 63, <laughs> as they age, can have hope relative to the treatment of what basically is a normal degenerative process of the human body. My emphasis here is that in bringing cannabis to the therapeutic landscape, we are not introducing a foreign substance. We are rather enhancing an existing system within the human body. And we would not hesitate to do this if it were another system, if it were another substance, and if it didn't have this reputation. So we invite you to take a careful look at this. We invite you to talk to your doctors, not all of whom are, are welcoming this. We invite you to try to help get your doctors into the system, going to the Pennsylvania Department of Health website, getting these doctors enrolled, getting them to sign up, getting them to take the training, and getting them, most importantly, to participate. We would like the relationship to exist between the patient and the primary care physician the patient and the primary care physician with a physician who will compassionately apply the principles which we've, dis which we've glossed over tonight that will help their patients. Because I truly, in my heart, believe in the goodness of humanity. And I think that once the medical community recognizes that this is a very potent tool in our, in our toolbox, I think the response will be overwhelmingly positive. But as is so often the case, we must listen to our patients not dictate to our patients. And I think it's people like the people who came here tonight, the people in this room, who need to draw this through the system by having those conversations with their doctors. Thanks for your time.
tinctures or whether they're pills or just, just really directing what kind of patient experience we can have and how to translate that easily. And I think if we're talking about medicine, we're talking about 24 hour coverage, so we need to have a, a multitude of the options out there. Well, it's exciting to kind of be part of that. And, and again, for us, it's about the education and the, the patient relationship. So anytime we can have a, a Q and A forum where, where I can answer any questions or, or help to lend any idea to any information out there or disinformation out there, it's really, you know, I, I can't help but be supported by such passionate, and intelligent, emotional <coughs> people. So please, um, and anything we can do, sort of you. Well, we had this, you know, oh, okay. sort of who qualifies, and then we had what happens in the dispensary. Oh, yeah, I'd love to talk about that. Yeah, and then we can open it up. So, patients with qualifying conditions, you ran food through 17 qualifiers. Um, you're going to go see, hopefully, your primary physician. They'll go through a recommendation state. You'll get a, he'll, he'll fill out a form that will go to the state. And you'll believe it's a $50 fee to the state, but they will waive if necessary for your registration card. Um, and then you bring that card down to the dispensary of your choice and register as a patient. And, and hopefully it will be, you know, we've got uh, some consultation areas for privacy, initial conversations, whether behind closed doors or on the sales floor, or how, whatever makes somebody comfortable is really you know, what we're looking to serve. Um, pretty straightforward as far as function goes. We don't know turnaround time yet. The Department of Health has a, has a website up that you can stay in line. They haven't gotten the patient uh, registration completely out yet. They're still working on it for the doctors and the doctors registered. So we're waiting patiently for when the patients can start registering. Um, and then just a couple more on what happens in the Again, basic experience, basic experience in, in dispensary is, you know, we, we believe in the educational process, so we're going to make our lobby open to the public. You don't have to have a, a medical card to come in and have a conversation with somebody and grab some pamphlets or, you know, to get some basic where to start information. Uh, we've kind of set that aside from most other dispensaries, I think, to build that into our standard operations. We'll reach in the front door, you know, everybody's gonna have to show an ID. Um, very, the lobby wants to be very comfortable. <laughs> like I said, you know, we we'll plan consult, we we'll private uh, consultations if necessary. Uh, and we'll have a doctor or a pharmacist on site all time. Um, we'll then go into what we we'll call the sales floor dispensing area, a couple of point of sales. Everybody in, in, in my sales staff will be. Uh, as knowledgeable as they can be, you know, we tend to build culture from the ground up as, as dealing with patients and what we know from medically. So there's no time limit, there's no constraints to, you know, we want to just deal with every individual the best way we can to make sure that this process is as functional for the patients as, as, as it can be. Um, so we've got dispensary techs that will be handling the dispensation of your product, which will be for a month, up to a month's supply. And then we'll also send out some caregivers, so if you're homebound or if you can't travel, there'll be a caregiver situation where you can assign a specific person to go procure your medication for you. Uh, I think those caregivers can hold up to five patients each. And I think I've read that they can kind of create a some swapping that can occur between a couple of caregivers and a group of patients. So I mean, they're really trying their best to serve the patients in, in any way they can as a state, and they're trying to facilitate that as well.
But if I understand, one of the biggest problems you're having <coughs> is finding physicians who will go ahead and get on the bandwagon. Correct. I think right now the portal we have is through the Department of Health website. You can go on to uh, pull up the Pennsylvania DOH website and they direct you to either a patient or a physician window. So you go to the patient window <coughs> and they will uh, break down some basic information as to where you are and give you what registered physicians there are in your area to contact. I'm, I'm assuming as the system gets up, maybe six months in, there'll be a, a bigger uh, facilitation of you know this group of doctors in that neighborhood, this group of doctors in this neighborhood. But we don't know that because we're still educating the doctors. I will say there has been a pretty good turnout um, on the state side uh, for doctors interested. Right? Like we can only see how many doctors click on that portal as an industry to see. There's a pretty good interest in the Southeast region. Uh, again, I think everybody touched on it. You guys are the key. Patients are the key for us to go explain to our doctor that if, if what's what we're going through isn't working, and we're his patient base, then we should probably talk about alternatives out there. You know, I mean, that, that's how we hope this whole system works. But right now, the only, the only portal is through the Pennsylvania DOH. I just Googled uh, marijuana doctor, and then I came up with was two sites, it was the high tech site for a doctor, which I signed up for, I'll have my physical or exam next week. And then there's another one, Compassionate Care. So, um, you know, I don't know if these are legit, but I paid my money, I'll go for the exam next week, and apparently he gives you the okay and you send it into the state. Right. That's my understanding, the high tech. That's locally, you meet in Lafayette Hills, his office in Lafayette Hills. But that's not the Compassionate Care Center. No, it's yeah. the high tech. Yeah. Well, again, I think word of mouth is going to be the best form right now outside of DOH um, and Google. Yeah. I'm, I'm signed up on the Department of Health waiting list for some patients. How well versed are your workers inside the store or your uh, in terms of dosage or what product, oils versus pills versus other, are going to be? You know, I'll give my personal guarantee they will be as well versed as they possibly can be. It's my intent, right? Eight years experience with understanding the difference between a supplement and a tincture and a topical, and they'll hopefully get to the flower and edible products and really be able to use this as a 24 hour functional medicine for people. Um, we're not here to sell anything, uh, we're here to serve the patients, so that, that's what we're hiring for the ground. My intent is to train, continuously train staff, you know, and, and a lot of the growth processors are willing to uh, plug into that educational side as well. They'll come in. I'm not sure exactly how it's going to play out, but they'll be able to come in and hold a day where we can educate uh, patients on specific products that they're, they have available, maybe with some sort of specials or, you know, uh, but we're working out. Again, for me, education is key. So the more we can put information out there for people, the better it will be. Yeah, I'll just mention one other thing, Jason. The, um, we're, um, our organization is part of the uh, Americans for Safe Access program, uh, patient focused certification. So. All of our dispensary technicians are going through, are going to go through that training program, which is above and beyond what the state requires as well. And we're looking at other training uh, capabilities as well. So it's an ongoing education. Education. Yeah, the dispensary is the last last step that we go to pick up the product. Correct. We talk about the permits issued, state of Pennsylvania. We have twelve so far out of twenty five. They're, they're growers, processors, and they are responsible for the final form. And we've got five different type products. You're telling me each guy that has a permit is responsible for the growing, the putting it into full form, or? Correct, so right now, the way to Make this like a little small factory. It, it, it's a very, it's a yeah, little small, it's, it's, it's optimistic. It's a, it's a very, uh, it's a large, Taking over, right? So they're, they're going to create a large scale <coughs> agricultural grow facility to grow the plant and then do some sort of extraction process to it. And that's the processing side of it. And then they will then put that into whatever variable forms, whether it be vaporizing in oil or pills or, you know, I, you know, I'm excited about topicals. I think that's really going to change a lot of people's lives. We talk about CD1 and CD2 receptors. The skin is lined with CD1 receptors, so it really functions well. As, a, as almost a medium topical um, 
belief. Um, but yes, the, drone, the 12 drone processors in the state right now are responsible for a plant, two product on site at their facility, and they will distribute it to us. They're also responsible for any ancillary products necessary to use said product. So if you, if you need a battery for a specific pen or a, you know, some, some ancillary products you need to use, we have to, all that comes right now, all that's coming through the grower process. What was the cost of the farm? Uh, I mean, the grower processor applications were different than the dispenser yeah, applications. Well, I understand that, yes. Um, I know the grower processor numbers were very large. So you have, what's exciting for me is there are, uh, you know, I've met all of them. So a lot of really good experienced grower processors coming from states that are functioning, whether it be Illinois or Maryland or uh, New Hampshire and Maine, that area. I mean, there, there's a lot of good experiential function being pushed out. So I think, you know, with the right dispensary minds out there to direct their focuses to product need for patients, um, I, think, I think we'll end up in a good place. I do. Uh, but and I don't think it's specifically the cost that was said. Uh, was a $10,000 non-refundable fee, $200,000 for the first year of license, and a $2 million uh, capital requirement. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Is it covered by insurance? I have not seen that uh, work out yet because insurance still falls under that federal uh, binding, right, legally. Uh, so give me an idea what a monthly <coughs> guy is going to be. It talks about the, the problem with that is uh, uh, we narrow me down into say what kind of supply of what. I give you I give you ballparks as to what topicals run in, in, in another state, right? In, in my medical dispensary in Colorado, uh, pills, cartridges. I can give you ballparks as to that. Um, a couple of things we're going to need to understand is your consumption rate for whatever said product for satisfaction. So is that one subliminal pill a day going to work for you, or are you going to need three? Is that one cartridge going to last you? A week or is it going to last you? There's some parameters in there that we're going to need to establish patient and facility. Uh, you know, I mean, average costs of, let's just run through some basic costs for product that I can throw at you, right? A uh, 100 milligram tincture, say anywhere from 35 to $50. Okay, a two ounce bottle, how long that lasts you is difficult for me to say here without knowing what your consumption rate is. Uh, topicals, again, 35 to 70 bucks, depending on the concentration, the, the formulation of CBD to THC. And, and everything tends to get more expensive when you add more CBD in it. And THC is regularly available in the plant, in the grow. CBD is a much lower value percentage-wise in that plant, so it gets harder to extract. and put on the market, so it gets a little more expensive when you add that stuff to said product. Um, it's hard for me to pin that one down. Uh, cartridges will go anywhere, I think, from entry level at you know, $25, $30 to $120, $150, depending on process and formulation <coughs> and uh, volume. There's a lot of factors in there. Am I helping you out at all? What's a cartridge? What does that mean? Yeah. A cartridge of what? The bread is going to cost like $6 a month. Right. Compare it. Uh, but the problem is, it's not like a man. The only bread is going to cost a month. It's for the rest of your life apart. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there, I know the state is working with some subsidy programs, right? And I'm hoping that that will translate better for certain sectors of, of the population that can't afford uh, cash only. Healthcare. Um, so again, I think we, we as a company have also instituted some, some uh, promises to the community that we will be giving compassion uh, dispensation. You know, reduce, we have to work with the state because the state's going to establish those parameters first as to who qualifies and what that is. Uh, I think we'll get there. I, I don't think it's, you know, I, I had some people that had a, a health savings account, but have, it was a debit card, basically, mm -hmm. they were paying into an account. And they can use that. They can cash out money. Have a, have a nice place. 
but it gets a little gray. Right? Show me a little work. I was wondering if the safe harbor category for children, if, if they're able to get the drug, or able not to in get state. The, that they go to Jersey, right? Yeah, I mean, again, yeah. they're procuring it illegally. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just know that's a few problem, that, right? that came out of CHOP that were, uh, you know, they were seizures from children. And yes. It's helped them tremendously. And Absolutely. I know they're going to Jersey, but I was wondering if, if there's comparability. Of course, we prefer Pennsylvania be doing it, right? But I just wanted to help. help uh, Give me two months. Because <laughs> I, I would think that would be on a fast track, especially since those children have been identified and are, are you know, progressing. Sure. I, I, again, I think the main yeah. issue is we can't fast track the growth of a plant. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, we can't necessarily fast track. And they are. You know, the state is doing everything they can to support the rolling out of this program on the grower processor side as well as the dispensary right. side. So they're giving every tool they, they're using every tool they can to to get growers up and running now because they understand it's a three or four month window sure. to grow the plant, then process it and do all the other things they have to do. So they're, they're doing the best they can to kind of work with it. Um, as you see, a lot of the grower processors are in the low the populated areas in rural Pennsylvania, out in the middle of, you know, um, areas that really could use some economic stimulus themselves. So it's nice to see the thoughtfulness um, take place. Again, I, I say two months, they get a little nervous when I say that. I, I, I've heard that we should have some product on, you know, available to us in the market mid to late January. Um, I think the market will be up and running by spring, you know, as we saw, we've seen the city. But our intent is to be open as soon as I can have product on the shelf that we deem, you know, feasible for patients. Okay, so now I'm going to address the uncomfortable topic in that it's actually not legal in the United States because we have a federal law which under the supremacy laws trumps all the state laws and then we have Mr. Sessions so he keeps threatening to shut it all down and I'm just wondering about the likelihood of that and also the likelihood of getting your name on a list of being someone who has Legally used it in Pennsylvania, but unlawfully used it federally. So, so I just share oh, my words. Oh no, I can. Again, I've, I've been a patient. I've been a patient for eight years, registered in the state of Colorado. Um, so I understand proactive defense. The idea that I'm using this as a medical option, I carry a call that a card that allows that, doesn't change the fact that it's seen illegal in a lot of states. What I'd say is being the 30th state on that list gives a little weight in function. And I, you know, my personal opinion is, Mr. Sessions has a very full plate. Medical cannabis is the least of his issues. <laughs> uh, I don't want to kid myself. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that, you know, you know, he, he could. I mean, for decades, he has been a crusader against it. This Absolutely. Just yesterday. I, I, well, um, we have the support of a multitude of state attorneys generals that do not support you know, um, So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fine dance. I don't think any of us are in the concern of stopping what we do because of the government's concern. It's been that way since day one for, for me. So you just add a little, a little bit of um, detail there in terms of how that, how that sort of uncomfortable truce has been maintained at least for the last several years, and it's, it's it's really been done on a on an annual basis. Using the U.S. budget, Congress has put an amendment into the budget every year, and it's re renewed every year. That basically says the Department of Justice cannot use federal funds to go after legal state medical programs. They specifically carved out medical programs versus adult use. Correct. Um, and it has to be renewed every year. Right. And of course, we are in the budget season now, and you know, once again, it's always, it's always. Um, and so, year by year, I, I, don't have, have, I think it's been mischaracterized as a tax on substance. I think that's I think incorrect, that's easy, yeah, but yeah. I don't see that changing. I mean, I, again, I hope that the, what we see is the landscape of medicine is changing, and I think mm -hmm. when we start looking at uh, healthcare. Look at 
Ethiopian scenario that's playing out in front of us nationally. There's some information that's going to come connected to medical cannabis states that I think will really start to shift that conversation. I mean, I'm an optimist. Um, and it hasn't stopped. I mean, they, they do go around and make examples every once in a while of a non-compliant uh, facility all over the country. But a lot of that has to do with <coughs> them not functioning in an above board or legal way. There, I, don't, I don't think anybody wants to take on, even in the federal government, I don't think they want to take on the state's rights issue. Mm-hmm. And I would hope that we have some senators uh, in this state, the governor in this state, that will support us in the state's rights uh, scenario. So, uh, you know, I believe there's some precedence to not, to them not pushing up on it hard on the medical side. That's my opinion. And again, I'm, I'm an optimist. I hope in the next five years it'll be federally. In a, in a perfect world, we pull it off the schedule. I see it being broken out into different formats, a list of cannabinoids and where they fall on that schedule. That's how I see it. <coughs> so pharmacies will have access to some of the stuff. Some of it will fall off the list. Um, but I think that'll, that'll play out in the next three to five years, personally. The, uh, I'm a registered pharmacist, and I believe in the 70s it should have been but like, it doesn't matter what I believe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it does. It matters what everybody here believes, and I think that's the showing of change. Again, you know, I mean, on the other hand, I don't want to risk my license. Well, that's the, the issue, the caveat with doctors, right? A lot of doctors are concerned because they're federally regulated through DEA on their script pad that uh, they, they, don't risk about they, they don't want to risk that. professional license. Correct. Um, and that's where we've seen the biggest push is the state or the federal government going after particular doctors. And what I saw was more so uh, what they refer to as green doctors, cannabis doctors, mm-hmm. doctors that are only writing licenses, uh, recommendations, they don't do anything else. So what, we, what I say about the Pennsylvania <laughs> legislation is that it's pretty clear about wanting to maintain that relationship with the primary physician and, and the patient. So you're seeing somebody who's, who understands your history, and this is truly an alternative to what you've been treating, whatever it is, for, rather than somebody who sets up shop just to write recommendations for patients, which is a, a necessity as well, unfortunately, until we have enough primary physicians that are willing to take that risk. Now, in, in Colorado, the registry was set up HIPAA compliant. You and I know HIPAA is a federal mandate. So just because it says it's HIPAA compliant doesn't mean it is. My experience was the state support was. When the state police wanted to get into that registry, they would not allow it. When certain CBI Colorado Bureau of Investigation wanted to use that registry, they would not allow it. So I, I believe it's a state-to-state example. My experience has been they were fairly supportive in that function, uh, as long as you were a compliant regulator. Um, how specific, so doctors will take a four hour class, become certified to recommend, correct? And and then how specific will they be? Like will they just, is, is it just a car you can choose your type? I want a tincture, I want a topical, I want a, or? The way the law is written, there'll be two options. The recommending physician will have the option of actually prescribing a given product with a given dosage. But I suspect what will be the much more popular option will be to find out, you know, leave it up to the healthcare professional at the dispensary. I will be, um, each group, each organization needs to have a physician on staff. And then we can have coverage by PAs and nurse pra- advanced care, uh, nurse practitioners at the adjoining sites at the same time. The vast majority of physicians I've spoken to who are going to participate understand that they're going to leave that, the choice of uh, product and the dosing up to the healthcare professional on site. The uh, four hour training course for doctors, I assume, is online. It is. Therefore, someone must have a handle on the participation in the Green County area, out of the state. The Department of Health. Well, whoever is right, the, the Pennsylvania Department of Health is running the training for both the 
physician as well as uh, all dispensary employees. So if they have a handle on I, I have no on. access to the information on physicians taking that course. They do share with us the physicians who signed up, who, who clicked into that window. So early on, a couple of weeks in, we saw 200, 200, 200 plus physicians only in the Southeast region click into the window of it should happen in the Southeast region. So it was 230 statewide, so half of them were in, in uh, the Southeast. But that was about two weeks after they opened the portal. And that was a month, at least a month ago. So I mean, I, I'm, I'm hoping that sets a good you know, pace for us. But I, I, I believe the patients are key. We were all the key to honor our doctor and say, hey, you know, it's the hot topic. Have this conversation before you're going to go there. That's my thing too. I was just I saw my PCP yesterday, and I think each and every one of us, when we see our doctor, we need to bring it up and and just very matter of fact, like you know, you're not asking for opioids or you're asking for alternative medicine. Should be exactly. And again, I think most physicians are at least open to the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Carol, you have a question in the same minute. Um, can we also get the cards from a specialist? So, if like a, for who's a specializing physician instead of a piece of paper? Yes? Specialists or any licensed physician in Pennsylvania with a good on un, the federal license. Right. Having so taken the board. Having right. Taken. Having reg is, is entitled to register. Mm -hmm. Any physician who registers <clears throat> is entitled to recommend. There's a notable exception to that. <laughs> the reason being, I it would be considered a conflict of interest, and I, ironically, will not be allowed in any way to recommend uh, medical marijuana. I do intend to work at one of our sites on a part-time basis and be making recommend, be making, what was, what's the word? Suggestions? Yes. Recommendations on site. Right. Recommendations on site, but I will not be able to sign the letter which gets you the permit from Harrisburg. And as far as I know, I'm the only exception, although I'm sure of the dispensaries will have positions involved. That being said, I would encourage, I have some friends who are doctors who are taking the test, and the reason they're taking the test is because so many people are asking them to. So, but I, um, I, want, to, I, I want two minutes. Yeah. In many states, okay, doctors have been able to charge separate fees for medical marijuana certification. I think in a very compassionate way, Pennsylvania made a rule that said that a doctor cannot charge an excess fee for a medical marijuana recommendation. In other words, if you come to my office, okay, I can charge you my regular fee for a 99213 visit, okay? But I can't say, ah, medical marijuana record, let's get another couple of hundred out of it. Can't do it, okay? What's good about that? Of course what's good about it is you're not gonna get ripped off. But what's bad about it? A doctor who wanted to charge an exorbitant fee or a high fee would be able to do it as long as he only did this. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, if I said, this is all I'm gonna do, I'm gonna charge 250 bucks, and I'm not gonna do anything else, so that's my fee. And sure, if somebody wants to come in with a bad toenail, I'll see him, but it's 250 bucks, I don't accept any insurance, that's my fee, I take it or leave it. That's legal. This is why I'm saying, talk to your doctor, exactly as you've been saying talk to your doctor. Doctors will get involved. They need to hear from you because they do not have a financial incentive. Yeah, guess what? Doctors like money like everybody else. There's no shocker there. They do not have the financial incentive to get involved unless you, as their customer, as their patient, tell them this is something I'm interested in. Will you help me? You're here. They're there to help you. They want to help you. But they've got to hear that it's something you want. We have to pull this through the system. We're not going to be able to push it. We have to pull it. And it's the people here who can do that. What's it going to cost the doctor to participate in this? The training is $400, I believe, or $200 for one course, $400 for another. Other than that, the registration, I think it's basically nothing. Correct. Now, it's not very expensive, but it's, it's not expensive until you got to pay it. You're getting nothing out. There's, There's no, no incentive for you to do it. There is no incentive for the individual to participate except if he wants to keep you as a patient and you say this is something I'm interested in. Okay, I can tell you patients are coming to me and saying it's something I'm interested in and I am actually facing the possibility of referring my patients to another doctor since as I said I'm in a unique situation, but that's just me. But if the doctor hears that this is part and parcel of what you anticipate as a service being available to you upon discussion, 
I'm not saying you go in there and say, car. You go in there and you say, listen, I've heard this may whatever, you know, this seems to be this, I know, this will help me, I can get off the prednisone. zone. Um, they need to hear that. I, I believe your doctors want to help you. I don't want to keep going through that. I would ask my doctor. And what was his response? He's, he laughed and he said, if it ever comes to pass, it. Well, that's guaranteed. That's guaranteed. And you can go look at the Dairy Queen where we've got sheetrock going on. How long ago was that? Just a couple of days ago. See, that's the concerning part for me. We had, we had talked to the department. Uh, there's not a lot of outreach from Pennsylvania to the physicians to let them know what's available out there right now. So the fact that your physician doesn't even know that it's an actual law and an option, you know, we're doing the best we can to fill, to fill rooms to get people to go back and let them know, hey, we got this piece of paper from somebody the other day. This is, this is the process. It's already up and running. And I'm, I'm interested in it as a patient, and I'd rather not have to go see a new primary care physician. I have an established relationship with you over the last however many years. Is this a conversation we're going to have, or do I have to go to, to your competition? How about this is a conversation? Sorry. <laughs> but that, but that, he's exactly right. That's this is the process. What's happening in this room, this is it. We're doing it, folks. This is it. Could the, uh, no could the growers, could the growers it's been a process, well, it's the same person. Did they say to you here? No, no. <laughs> uh, and their sales force. Product sales, right? Like sales right? Yeah. I hate to say just like, but I mean they're gonna they're gonna pull from a pool that existed and isn't selling as much product. Correct. But they hire salespeople to go visit doctors and give them a spiel. The state's pretty adamant of not well, allowing the, the collusion of the industry and the physician <coughs> at all. Whether it be on my side, we can't go out to the doctors and solicit them and work in the door process. Patients have to. I'm for for continuing education. I was just going to say, give me one second. I got the marijuana that I've taken for credit. Part of courses where? They, they have continuing education courses for professionals like yeah. me and doctors mm -hmm. that I've taken on marijuana. Right. That, that, I mean, that. But that's not by the industry. That's just, you know, the studies that are out there, what they said, and things like that. And that, and that functions in your. Uh, in your industry as continued education, like right. those yeah, your industry. Take continued education. Correct, to but if it's cannabis it. related, they still yeah. take it as qualified yeah. courses. Yeah. Brilliant, awesome. Lady in the back. I was just going to add to, and I think because I come from, you know, a, a medical sales background now in the cannabis industry, but what a lot of people don't understand is pharma drug, pharma companies come out with new drugs every day. You think your doctor learned about them in his years ago when he graduated and earned his PhD? No. It's pharma reps that are going out and selling those drugs to doctors and telling them how to prescribe and qualify patients. We don't have that in this industry, so it's you that are the sales reps for this new drug that doesn't have pharma lobbyists pushing for it. It's just us. That's how it works. Oh, but you're having an educational event for physicians tomorrow night, right? Yes. Tell your doctors about it, because that you are allowed to do. King of Prussia, we're doing a meetup for medical professionals, specifically nurses, physicians, again, uh, bringing in a couple of patients to speak uh, directly to product use. Uh, I have a doctor there as well. You know, again, for us, it's just a matter of starting the educational dialogue with as many people as we can to get to a place where patients and physicians are comfortable having the conversation. I mean, every doctor is going to be a, a recommender. I, I'm aware of that. We've only sold them out. That's not sold, but we've only we filled uh, over 40. But where are we at on the meetup right now? Over 40? We are at 40. Yeah. Max, which is, yeah, we're maxed out there. Yeah. We might be able to what we stay up up the And what we've seen across the state, I'm sure you may have seen here or not heard. Give me one second. Um, I won't forget, I promise. But, <laughs> just the, the response from people in the local community, right? There was a. Uh, a woman outside of Pittsburgh who had a health fair. Yeah. She planned on about 150, 200 people to show up at the health fair. Similar to that, started as a grassroots information campaign. Over 1,100 people show up. You know? Uh, right? Yes. You were there. Yeah. Um, standing room only out the door. The, a job fair held by one of the growing processors out in the middle of the non-populated Pennsylvania. Um, they had 
340, 400 people show up for 35 jobs, job opportunities. So again, you know, I got to talk to one of the contractors out in Jersey Shore, PA. Born and raised here. I don't know where that was. <laughs> found in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere. So, and they understood this is the future, right? Whether we're talking about um, short term or long term, we're talking about reinvigorating our state with a new industry, new, new possibility. And so, I, you know, I think we in the Southeast, especially in the greater Philadelphia area, I think we have a, a responsibility to, to flesh this out the best way we can um, because we are the weight of this state. Right? You know? So to me, I'm excited to be here as part of it and to be as transparent as I can be in this system. On the other end of that, there are many employers that require drug tests before they hire. Are there any protections for patients for that? What I saw, what I saw in my experience was eventually employers realized that if you're now in a state where there's a large medical cannabis population, Colorado was a decent one, um, they changed from, say, a, a randoms to a pre employment and situation. Right? So they're not going to surprise you with a drug test. They'll tell you when you're going to take it, pre employment, or they'll tell you if you're vaccinated, this is what you're responsible for liability. There's, there's, I mean, again, it's, it's the standard that they can, we're in a freedom to work state here as well. I believe, you know, Colorado, they can terminate for any reason or not hire for any reason. So th there was no protection for the death of the patient. Didn't they make one protection where if you did get hurt and when you, before you started the job, if they knew that you were a medical cannabis user, if you got hurt, you could get like 50% of your workers' compensation or something like that? It wasn't that they only... I, I believe it's a state to state case. I'm just talking about in Colorado. I think right. that's the only um, one that actually made it. Uh, so Pennsylvania wants to know. Uh, they, I was concerned that there was not even a safe harbor for above 18, right? Like we're going to say that we believe this is patients. People need it. And I appreciate it. And that's you know, where the advocacy, the advocacy for the legislation came from was those mothers and those children. So that's why they built that safe harbor law. But I'd like to see safe harbor for. Anybody who is presently in the system wanting to be a patient or was a patient, who, whatever. Um, what happens to those eight, 17 year olds that turn 18? Yeah. Uh, they, they don't have any harbor? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> wow. So that's, I mean, as, as of January, we want to eliminate that safe harbor concept and introduce yeah. those families to legal yeah. purchasing in the state. Yeah. Sure. What kind of training does Keystone offer? I would love to work for a career. I'm in the area and I'm just looking for a new career and I would love to get in this industry. What kind of uh, training do you offer uh, for your workers? Do you right. beforehand, uh, ongoing on your work? Sydney and I talked and saw each other at the Amstaff, right? It's a great place to start for anybody who's looking. You know, there's some decent companies out there that offer baseline education if you don't have any. I, I did that and I did a CTU, so I have two certificates. Okay. And I just came back from Colorado and picked everybody's brain and rubbed as much stuff on my body as I could. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not shy. <laughs> now, I, it really, I did, um, I did um, SAS for my back and it really did work for a whole week, but I had to leave it there. <laughs> so, we, so we have the so obviously there's the state required two hour training that's you know basically goes through the law, talks about the um, you know safe handling of product and that kind of thing, and then we we also have the ASA training that we're providing uh, Americans for Safe Access uh, patient focused certification, which is uh, additional training that kind of goes uh, above and beyond what the state provides uh, and. We're also looking at uh, developing really specialized training for our teams, um, you know, based on sort of our experience and knowledge and, you know, drawn upon Jason's experience. Um, one of the things that we're considering and we're looking at actively is the idea of doing um, sort of centers of excellence around the different, the different sites. So each site may have a, a additional training for the staff around a particular set of conditions. 
and that would be uh, so every site will serve all all 17 serious medical conditions full spectrum of the products that are available but um, for example we may have um, an autism and seizure disorder center of excellence or a pain and PTSD center of excellence um, another one we talked about was integrative or holistic therapies in the center of excellence so we may be developing and we anticipate probably developing additional training for the staff that's going to be working at those sites as well as resources so that we can become a, a destination center for some of those um, conditions. So, so I'd like to add to that, uh, the relationship with grower processing. They're, they're excited, the other sales staff that we've got uh, educated extractors and people who are being hired from other states to come in, they're excited to share that knowledge as well. So I will, you know, I will routinely have a crossover day with one of the grower processors My experience from the professional side is tried and true, right? Like I am a patient, I'm a patient first, and so I never put anything on the shelf that I didn't try and didn't work function. So we never sell anything. So I think we as a culture build the same thing. We're, we're gonna, you know, only invoke the products that we know work quality um, and be able to translate that from everybody in staff, that same level of education. Jason, I think, I think the two closest um, grower processors to us are Berks County, the closest to Philly. Yes. Do you know if they've broken ground or started growing? So, you know. no, nobody, there's only one grower processor in the entire state that was uh, deemed operational. Okay. And that was announced last week. Uh, okay. And really what that means is they can start growing. Okay. Uh, we're looking at, I've had contact with a couple other ones that by the end of this month, and so we can start clones and you know plant plants can start but they are yeah they're, they're a month or two from being finished out as well. Prime's been building but the other one Franklin kind of like a ghost town I don't know what they do I drove by one time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 Prime broke ground they said they're they're on track so um, I haven't got up to look at the, the facility but as soon as they were awarded, they, they were on the ball and sure. yeah, they're, I'm not. Except they're, they're one of the ones that are predicting, you know, the, the, the windfall of product to show up February, March. Um, and when are you looking to be open? January. And again, I, you know, yeah. we're, we're slated to be, and there are a couple of grower processors I'm working with that I don't want to exclude anybody in any relationship, but there, there are a couple that are looking to be first to market as well. So there's a lab process, state mandates, and uh, every grower processor that I've come across is also building an in-house lab. So they will, you know, from genetic, you know, at this point, you know, being the 30th medical state on the list, it really worked out as the case. And so being able to lock down specific genetics that we now know do certain things and function certain ways um, is hugely important for the grower processor to have a functional product in the back end. So they're building the consistency into the uh, facilities, whether it be in their extraction methods. I mean, you're talking about full clean rooms, really high-end lab type environments. Um, so I'm pretty confident that, that they mandated both the lab in-house and that they will all have to be tested through the state before it hits our shelf. So there'll be, you know, there'll be specific labeling, there'll be specific uh, concerns for how it was grown, and how it was processed, what kind of stuff was left behind, or, you know, all that will be prepared to So I'm going to suggest that we, we sort of wrap up on the questions, uh, you know, sort of in a group format. If we can stay here for and answer some questions one on one, that, that's okay. So, uh, presentation helpful and informative. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming out and uh, thanks to Dr. Vanderbeek.
Jason Mitchell and Skip Shooter for making the presentation.